Recently, the Australian National University said that baseload power is functionally extinct. Generally, we say baseload power is provided by things like nuclear power plants or coal power plants or gas, but that is drastically changing. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. I'm Sam Evans. You're watching The Electric Viking. Great to have you with us. If you haven't already subscribed to our newsletter, I'll put a link in the description below. Traditional utility grid management suggests that there are three types of load. So what exactly is base load? Well, you've got base load, shoulder, and peak. Base load is underlying 24 seven energy demand. In other words, kind of a minimum demand that's always needed. Peak load is regular, but short-lived periods of high demand and shoulder loads are what lie in between. Under this model, system planning is straightforward. For an electricity grid, you assign different types of energy generation to the different loads according to the price and qualitative characteristics of that grid. Now, grids are all different, completely different. But here in Australia, historically, coal supplies most base load demand since it is relatively cheap and very slow to ramp its output up or down. That's uh, mostly a bad thing, to be honest. We have to keep coal plants running. We can't just shut them off. In some countries, base load is met with nuclear since it is even less flexible than coal. But only two countries generate more than 50% of their energy from nuclear. So in most countries, nuclear is not the main source of power. In fact, in nearly every country, nuclear is not the main source of power. Now, why is it that nuclear power plants can't really be turned off or are very difficult to do so? They can be turned off, but turning them off and on actually drastically shortens the lifespan of a nuclear power plant. So this is avoided at all costs. With the roles of different generators clearly delineated, power planters' jobs are much easier in this idealized system than today's grid. However, in a system or a grid with lots of solar, and while most countries now have entered this phase, prices fall dramatically at around midday, we call this the duck curve, because solar has no fuel cost. Because much of Australian solar is on rooftops, we have 4 million households with rooftops, grid demand also falls at the same time. For those hours, baseload generators must either operate at a loss or they have to just shut down. And you'll find that in places like China, um, coal power plants are often actually making a loss even after they run during the nighttime because they're losing money during the day. Continuing to generate produces more energy than the grid requires at a very low or negative prices. This is not a conscious choice. It is the structure of the market the cheapest bid gets dispatched first. And obviously the cheapest bid during the middle of the day is going to be solar. Or when it's really windy, it's going to be wind. In practice, most baseload generators are simply not capable of ramping up and down fast enough. They must bear loss-making prices in the middle of the day and try to make it up with high prices during peak periods. But during peak periods, this is when a lot of people who have their own batteries, and particularly energy companies with their own batteries, are actually basically becoming peaker plants and disrupting the market for coal and nuclear. Whenever the peak periods occur, these batteries are generated into the grid, they, put their, they dump their electricity into that time and try to make as much money as they can. This daily up and down ramp though is called load following and it brings efficiency losses and extra maintenance costs for fossil fuel power plants. As solar increases, this dynamic makes base load generators impractical and unprofitable says Australian National University. Already this is the situation in South Australia. In the last week of winter in 2024, South Australia ran on more than 100% net renewables. South Australia is instantaneously meeting 100% of demand from solar alone most days. It is no surprise that South Australia's last coal-fired power plant shut nearly a decade ago. In 2016, after years of being operated only seasonally. The rest of Australia has not yet caught up to South Australia and Tasmania in terms of renewables, and there is still a case for coal in the national energy market, sort of, for the short term. The trend, though, in solar uptake is abundantly clear, 
and there will be no economic case for coal in just a few short years time anywhere in Australia and in fact in most countries worldwide either. So storage is nailing the coffin shut on baseload. Excess energy in the middle of the day is useless if no one wants to use it or if they want to use it overnight. This is where firming is required. When variable renewables are paired with enough storage or backup power, it is called firm. For a utility grid, this means large amounts of storage such as batteries and pumped hydro energy storage, as well as flexible generation such as hydro and possibly open gas cycle turbines. In our transitioning grid, in many transitioning grids around the world. Baseload generators run at a loss in the day, while storage often takes cheap solar to sell at peak times. This is called energy arbitrage, buying low and selling high. It's exactly what Tesla does with its mega packs located at its superchargers. It charges those big batteries when electricity is cheap and obviously sells that electricity to consumers at much higher prices. This is extremely profitable. And it's why private industry has spent hundreds of billions of dollars on building their own batteries without subsidies. It is tempting to think this arrangement could continue, but it can't and it won't. As more batteries come online, the economics of baseload generators only get worse. There's a reason why the biggest coal companies in the United States have gone bankrupt over the past 10 years. We are set for a storage surge as utility batteries come online, electric vehicles in, integrate with the grid, and household battery subsidies create an enormous surge in household solar and batteries. Plus, battery prices are continuing to plummet, particularly with new sodium ion batteries coming to market at potentially half the cost of lithium ion phosphate and also last, lasting more than three times as long. The writing is clearly on the wall. In this future, midday energy is still practically free because storage cannot consume it all and peak power prices are reduced because of battery arbitrage. Without profitable peak power prices, the economics of baseload generation are well and truly dead. That means the future for coal power plants, for nuclear and gas cycle peak and gas power plants is looking increasingly worse by the day. Power-hungry data centers have been meeting planning roadblocks because they consume more power than local infrastructure can handle. Rather than waiting for third parties to build our infrastructure, big tech companies want to take matters into their own hands. The possibility of big tech companies commissioning or commandeering nuclear reactors to supply new data centers with 24-7 power has created a media buzz. Everyone thinks this is what's going to happen. It's unlikely that a self-reliant data center would look to 100% renewables. This is not because renewables are unreliable. It is because firming renewables is easier at larger scales. Wide geography helps to smooth out locally variable weather. Obviously, solar and wind we're talking about here. Now, although nuclear is the most expensive power option, big tech has cash to burn. The bigger hurdle to new nuclear is a 10 year plus build timeline. And there is currently not a single nuclear reactor being built in the United States. Whether or not data centers adopt nuclear power is irrelevant for civil electricity because utility electricity grids are not data centers. If big tech builds nuclear to power data centers, it neither proves nor disproves that that technology is a good option for the whole grid. It's basically meaningless when we look at the grid as a whole. Nuclear for Australia is madness, says the Australian National University. If Australia was to build out nuclear power plants as its opposition would like to do, it would require a forever subsidy to compete in the market. In other words, we would never make our money back, not even by a long shot. The industry is aware of this. Daniel Westerman, chief executive of the market operator AEMO, was recently quoted as saying, Australia's operational paradigm is no longer baseload and peaking. AEMO has said competition from renewables is a key reason why coal has been retiring faster than announced. That's the Australian electricity grid saying coal power plants are going extinct faster than we thought because 
of renewables. We don't actually need baseload. The market is aware and the industry is aware that baseload is not endangered. It is already functionally extinct. If Australia was to build a nuclear power plant, taxpayers will be the proud owners of an unprofitable, uncompetitive, expensive and unsellable liability. The Sydney EV International Motor Show. If you want to get a 50% discount on your tickets, all you got to do, click the link in the description and use the promotion code that's in the description. Just copy and paste that. Now I should mention there's only 200 tickets available per day. So if you go to use the promo code and you can't get a ticket, wait till the next day. Don't wait until the day before the show to get your tickets because otherwise you'll probably miss out on getting the 50% discount.